Thank you for the introduction. Um, sorry to disappoint you, I do not have an Australian accent because I am originally from Poland or kind of from Germany. The, the accent is all over the place. I currently live in Australia. So this talk was initially supposed to be a little bit of, bit of a uh, surprise sort of thing, like oh, what if Ember had context, but the surprise has been spoiled by all the previous talks that have mentioned context already. Um, so you know it already exists. Um, but maybe not everyone knows what context is all about. Um, some of you maybe have used React or Svelte or other frameworks that already have context. Um, so I'll introduce you to the concept first. So don't worry, we'll learn all together. Um, but first, so at Custom.io, our main product is still an Ember app, but recently I found myself working with uh, React projects as well. And we're updating our company's design system and the component library that comes with it. Uh, this is one of our testing screenshots with all the button states. Um, due to the nature of our projects though, we decided to build two component libraries at the same time. So we have a separate library for React and Ember, but they're both based on the same design system and the same tokens. Um, but yeah, whether that was a good idea at all, um, building two systems, not sure if that was good, uh, but I'm not gonna dive into that because that would be an entirely different talk, like how to build two systems at the same time. Uh, not today. Um, but I found myself building these components in parallel for both frameworks at the same time. We also have a really cool storybook set up that compares the components to each other. Again, not today. Um, but my aim was to keep the component APIs as similar as possible, because I wanted our developers to um, still know what's happening and how to use the components when they switch between projects. Um, and on the React side, I used context to provide state to the components, uh, to the library components. Uh, but then I realized that cont context is not available in Ember, so I couldn't quite make the APIs that similar because um, obviously the internals would change. You'd have to change the way how you invoke the components. So I had to rethink things a little bit. A little bit. But before I dive into that, uh, let's talk about context itself first. So by the nature of HTML, the websites and apps that we build, uh, there are always these tree-like structures. HTML elements are nested in each other and they create branches that can be many layers deep. And components in all the frameworks that we use, uh, building on top of HTML, they are also rendered in trees. Uh, in a components template, we can invoke simple HTML or we can invoke more components, um, building them to any sort of depth that we want. And with components, uh, we can also pass down arguments deep down the tree. The components also form relationships. We can talk about parent components or child components, referring to the components that are directly above or below. Uh, or we can talk about ancestors and descendants, talking about components that are um, you know, all the um, components further up the tree or all the children and grandchildren of a particular component. Um, and when we render these components, we pass arguments into them, which could be like state uh, callbacks, options, whatever we want. And then as the complexity of, uh, complexity of our app grows, the component tree can become quite deep. Uh, we have components that render children and grandchildren and so on, and sometimes the great grandchild component will need access to a variable that was passed in at the top level. And the only way to get that variable down there is to pass it through each layer. We have to explicitly pass that prop or argument through each component in that tree until it reaches the component that needs it. And this repeating, this is a passing of arguments is uh, something we usually call prop drilling. And this Nothing really wrong with prop drilling as such. It's something we have to do, um, but it can become tedious having to repeat arguments uh, through all these levels sometimes. Uh, and it can also make our components a bit harder to maintain if we have to repeat arguments that, that sometimes are just not even relevant to one of the components. It's just the component is somewhere along the way uh, and it needs to pass this argument through. It's, it's just unnecessary. And context is a way to solve that prop drilling problem in like a dependency injection sort of way. Um, a context can be provided, we say, at a top level, and then any component that renders as a child or grandchild, like somewhere in that tree, deeper down within the provider, 
can access that state, like similar to services where you just get the state almost out of nowhere. Um, and if you've worked with React or Vue or Svelte, uh, you've probably used this already. In React, this is called create context and use context. Vue has provide and inject. And I now realize the links are a little bit cut off. Um, so I'll share these slides later. Um, so we have provide and inject in Vue. We have uh, set context and get context in Svelte. And to put this into practice, this is what it would look like in React. You create a context object, which itself doesn't do much. It's just a representation of the state that you will be making available. But it gives you a provider component, which you can then render in your app. And that provider component receives a value. And that's the value that will be made available to all the children and grandchildren. And then if you want to use that context, retrieve the state in a component that's deeper down the tree, you call use context and give it that context representation that you created earlier. And now you can pull out the data that you've provided somewhere further up the tree. And anytime the data changes, this component will also re-render. So it subscribes it to any sort of reactive state. Um, so this is context. It's quite simple. It looks like service injections. It's great. Um, and if this is still unclear, we'll have some Ember-based examples along the way, so don't worry. So going back to my design system, while the React components use context and they work quite well, I couldn't build that same thing in Ember. So I had to reevaluate what I can do first before making any further decisions. So I stopped my development and I thought about what is possible in Ember right now and how that might apply to React, because maybe I can just like drop context and use Ember patterns in React. Um, the spoiler is that I didn't, um, but I did have to reevaluate what is available. So I broke it down to uh, three state sharing patterns, essentially. Um, we can pass state around with prop drilling, which we've covered. Um, it, Ember also has contextual components and services, of course, um, uh, which we'll dive into in a sec. With prop drilling, um, if you were building a component library or using a component library, you might agree that um, if the library didn't have context, didn't have contextual components, it would be pretty annoying, tedious, having to pass around arguments uh, for the library. Like you can imagine a select or drop down menu component where the drop down menu items uh, need all the same arguments repeated that you've already passed into the select component. It's super annoying, super tedious. So you don't want to write your component libraries this way, which is where um, other sharing, uh, state sharing patterns come in, like contextual components. You might already be thinking, well, I've been talking about prop drilling. Uh, contextual components already solve that problem. Yeah, they do. If you're not familiar with contextual components, um, this is a quick reminder. Contextual components is when we uh, yield, use a yield keyword to um, make certain components available as you consume another one. So you combine the yield keyword with the component helper to uh, provide the developer with components with partially curried arguments so that you don't have to manually pass those arguments in. It's already like a pre-configured component, basically. So here, the select component, uh, which will be an example that we'll use for a little bit in this talk, could yield the child components like a label or an item with partially applied arguments already. So the developer that's using this component doesn't have to repeat values that are internal and tied into the component like a selected value. You don't have to think about that when consuming a component, which is great. This is a well-established, uh, widely used pattern in Ember. You're probably familiar with it. And I'm a big fan of the composition patterns that this makes available. Like This is so unique and really cool about Ember. Uh, this doesn't really exist in other, uh, in other frameworks. This is one of my favorite features. Like The composition pattern is just fantastic. But it doesn't really uh, fix prop drilling. It doesn't remove prop drilling. It just moved the prop drilling elsewhere. It, it's still there. If the yielded components, the select item component, um, had more components uh, deeper down the tree, you'd still have to repeat all these props. It doesn't actually solve the whole problem. And then we also have services. And services are probably the closest thing we have to context right now in Ember. Uh, but they don't really um, address the same problem. Services are global. You usually have, you can have singleton, ins um, you can have uh, multiple instances of services, but you don't usually do that. So a service is usually 
a singleton instance global throughout the app, any component accessing a service will be accessing the same value. So if you want to restrict the state that you're passing to a component tree, um, that's not going to do it. This is global. Um, it's not going to help solve your issues. So before I continued building my components, I did some thought experiments. And you know where these thought experiments ended up, because you already know that the add-on exists. So this was supposed to be the sort of hypothetical what-if scenario. Um, but that's what I did. So I started thinking about what if we did have context, and I wrote pseudocode. At this time, when I was writing this down, like, uh, this didn't exist. I was just thinking, what if? So I thought that if there was context, um, like I said, services are already quite similar to how I feel you might consume a context. If we did have context, I imagine we might have a decorator that I called consume. You give the consume decorator a context name, just like you give the service decorator a service name, and it just returns the value of um, the context. Simple. Additionally, uh, I feel like a context consumer component might be useful for usage in templates or template-only components where you don't have a backing class to apply the decorator to. So there's a context, context consumer component where you give it the key, which is, again, the context name, and it yields the context value, which you can then use in your template. Um, I think this was shown in one of the previous slides, the Embedata upgrade path, so this is not entirely unfamiliar to you now. But then, how do we provide context? I couldn't quite use the service patterns that we have available, because again, services are uh, installed globally, but context needs to be tied to the component trees. It needs to live on the component level. So I couldn't create a, a class that's um, initialized and registered in the app. So I started with the decorator again, because that's a pattern that we're familiar with, we're comfortable with decorators. Uh, and this one is called provide. It's kind of similar to the um, view provide function, just the naming. You give it the context name, uh, which is the one that we use in the consume decorator, and you attach it to anything you want, really. Here it's attached to a getter, and whatever the getter returns will be the value of the context. You could also attach it to a, a stable reference or a, a property or a class instance that you initialize. It can be anything. Additionally, uh, there's a context provider component, similar to the context consumer, again, to use your context in template-only scenarios. So from a developer's perspective, you don't need anything else to use context. This is it. This is uh, two decorators, two components. Uh, you're ready to go. So you know, it took me a little bit of talking to just introduce two boring decorators to components. Uh, that could be it. You know, I could say thank you, get off stage. But example is where context uh, really starts to shine. Like we need to see it in action. So uh, let's have a look at some of those examples. I am going to back to the select component that I mentioned before. Uh, and I have to reiterate that contextual components work quite well for a select component. You can see this in Ember Power Select. I, I feel like that's one of the most popular <laughs> add-ons in the community. Um, and yeah, there's nothing wrong with using contextual components for this. But if we used context for this one, I feel like the components API could simplify a little bit further, be a little bit more composable. So the top one is the contextual version, and the bottom one is the context version. Oh, it's, it's terrible naming. Bottom one is the context version. Um, and in the new version, the parent component would no longer have to yield any item components or ca carry any arguments into them. All it would have to do, which is not pictured here, uh, that's an implementation detail, it would only have to provide a context to be used for any components that are nested within. Um, the code we would have to write as a developer to use the select component changes a little bit. We no longer have to write as s to get access to whatever has been yielded, um, because the yield statements have been removed. Anything um, that's rendered within component, that, that's it. There's, there's nothing yielded. We've also replaced the yielded label with a generic form field label component, which we could then reuse across any sort of form field component. Uh, no matter where we use it, because it uses context, it would access the value with the consume decorator. No matter where it's put within the select component, it would always have access to those values. Um, so it could be universally used across many other components. And then finally, the select item component. We no longer use any yielded ones, so we just 
invoke a regular component by its name. So when you put these examples side by side, it just ha highlights how similar these code snippets are, like what's the point? Um, the developer that's using uh, these new components uh, maybe doesn't see a benefit immediately, but the developer who builds the component, the select component, like a component library developer or an ML Power Select developer, can see a much larger benefit. Um, say the select component lived in an add-on that um, is like a component library add-on, uh, many reusable components, and you'd like to allow other developers to use these select components, but also style them to match your, your business and styling needs. This uh, library is called uh, headless libraries, referring to the fact that they don't have any styles or like very minimal styles that are easy to override, um, and that's a common scenario. So if we were trying to customize an add-on's contextual component that doesn't have any styles or minimal styles, we may not have easy access to any of the internals to actually configure these things comfortably. To apply our styles, we would have to wrap the select components uh, and yield our own item components, carrying all the same arguments that the original author already carried. So we'd have to look at the original library's code and basically duplicate the templates but with our own components. Um, I've seen this a little bit in our app with Ember Power Select where we have to look into the Ember Power Select internals and copy over all the arguments so that we can customize the component. It's possible, but uh, tedious. So then for the select item component, we'd uh, have to do the same. Here we apply our own uh, classes, could be tailored classes, whatever styling system we use. Uh, but then again, we'd have to copy over all these arguments that already are defined in some other library. It's, it's a very annoying process. And whenever anything changes in the other library, you have to copy over the arguments again. It's a lot going on. So if the add-on used context to provide the state, a developer like me would have a much easier time trying to customize these components. Because uh, the components are no longer as connected, I can style my components in isolation, knowing that the context that provides the value is accessible no matter where the components are. So I can style my components in isolation, I can rely on the fact that the select item component, the one that actually does the work internally, will have access to the value no, many, uh, no matter how many wrapper components I will need to add to achieve my styling needs. And in fact, you may not even have to use a select item component at all. Context would allow you to build uh, things like, things kind of like React hooks. Here, uh, you can imagine we could build a hook uh, or function that's called use select, which does basically the same thing that the select item component would do. It gets access to the select parent component's context and gets all the values out of it and does certain computations that um, you can then um, use within your components to access all the state. Like you can build your select item component, um, making sure, uh, knowing that you have access to the context. And here, the use select function, you can see that it doesn't have the uh, provide or consume decorator attached, like in the previous examples. And this is a pattern that we could introduce that is similar to the use function from Ember Resources or the uh, hypothetical service, uh, the functional form of service injection from Ember Polaris service. Uh, so it's, again, a pattern that is already existing in Ember. And we can do this because if we pass in this into our use select function, the um, use select function has access to the component instance, and through that instance, it has access to the owner, the Ember app. So we can hook in that function into whatever does the context tree internal tracking. So if you've worked with React hooks, uh, this kind of looks like React hooks. And uh, since we're talking about forum elements, let's look at some other forum uh, element examples. Uh, we had a accessibility talk earlier today, so accessibility is a good example to talk about. Um, one common accessibility requirement is to provide labels for your phone controls. And your phone controls could also have additional help text or error messages applied. And to make these accessible, uh, you usually use additional attributes to connect all these together. Here, the um, label points to the input via the for attribute, which points to the input's ID. And then you have the description, which is linked with the input via the aria described by attribute, which points to the paragraph's ID. So if we used context, we could build components that generate these attributes and then later set them automatically for us. 
So when we're building our app, we don't actually have to think about any of the accessibility details. It all just hooks it up automatically for us. So we're building a, yeah, I hope you can see this. We're building a, a hypothetical generic form field component, which we can then use as the parent component for any sort of form field like a text input or select uh, box. And there's a few things going on here. First, we generate a unique ID for the whole group of elements if one isn't provided as an argument already. We generate unique IDs for any elements that might exist within that component, like the description or the input itself. And we also create a modifier here, which uh, will then register the existence of a description to know whether a description has been rendered at all. And you'll see in the next slide uh, how this works. And finally, we take all these values and provide them in a context so that all the child and grandchild components can actually access the, these values. Then we have the form field child components, which might look like this. Uh, I tried keeping it simple, but it's very hard to fit all this code. Um, so the individual form components, they would consume the form field context and then set the necessary attributes. And the description component, it attaches the modifier that we made available in the form field, which then lets the form field context know that the description has been rendered, which the input then uses to render the aria described by attribute. So then when we consume these components, uh, we don't have to worry about any of these internals. We just render it like this. And because uh, the form label, the text input, everything is nested within form field, all these uh, context things are, are doing the setup for us. This is already accessible. You don't have to do anything extra. You could pass in an ID if you'd like. Uh, you don't have to. It's all done internally. So as a developer, I can compose these components in whatever order or shape I want. I can add any um, wrappers which I might need for styling needs. I can rearrange them. And they always work the same if they're nested within the form field. So using context, we could build libraries that make it even easier to do accessible stuff. Like we could have utilities and components that abstract this, these things even further. But then you run the code that I just wrote, and it, it, it actually doesn't work. Um, you get this maximum call stack size is exceeded error. Um, and yeah, maybe you just shouldn't work with context at all. I'm not going to ship this to production. Uh, I don't think I can write good code at all. And I think I saw a few skeptical faces in the audience a few slides back. So let's go back to the form field and see what went wrong. And this is just to highlight that anything you provide in context is just like regular reactive Ember code. Um, so the problem that I'm seeing here is actually not unique to context at all. This is just me not being careful about my getters and my track properties. So what happens here is uh, the form field context is a getter, which means that it will always recompute, re-render when any of the track properties it references change. Uh, you can see that the register description modifier, which we've attached to the description component, uh, it sets the has description property. Uh, which will have the form field context recompute, which will have the description component rerun the modifier, which again will set the hash description, and it'll just keep running in this loop. That's why it breaks. Um, and again, this can happen easily uh, even without context if we're not careful about our getters. Um, but for me, it's particularly important with context to be very vigilant about how we arrange our getters and our track properties. Because I feel like the, the disconnection that exists between the components that provide and consume context just makes it easier to forget that these connections actually do exist. So we have to be really careful about how we arrange our pop properties. But how do you fix this particular issue? Well, one thing could be to break it up into multiple smaller contexts. One component can provide multiple contexts as long as they all have different names. Um, but of course, we still run the risk of creating infinite re-renders here. Uh, the actual problem here is fixed by removing the has description accessor from the description context. That has been moved into the form control context. Uh, and by the way, as your app grows, and you may have seen this in React context implementations, if you have a lot of template-based context, your app is just gonna keep growing sideways. And there's nothing wrong with that. Like the, the app will still render just the same. But if you're trying to debug this in Ember Inspector, you're going to have to scroll like very far to get to your uh, actual app's content to try and like debug anything. And with this implementation of context, by using the provide decorator, you can provide multiple contexts from one component. So you might not see this issue at all, which is great for Ember, bad for React. So back to the form now. After we split up the big context into many smaller contexts, 
The individual form components look like this. They're admittedly quite similar. They just access their own um, small individual contexts now. Um, but in this refactor, there's one additional ben benefit beyond just fixing the bug. Previously, I hope you noticed that the text input component was checking whether the description is rendered and then setting the array described by attribute, which means that it has to know that a description component is a thing and that may render. But now all it receives is the aria described by attribute directly. It doesn't have to worry about what components do or do not exist. Uh, all it receives is what value do I set for what property? It doesn't have to worry about any externals that are happening. And this now renders. This actually works great. Um, there's alternative fixes, um, and I won't be diving into the details here. But essentially what you have to do is uh, remember that anything can recompute. So if you wanted to fix these recompute issues, you can also provide a stable reference to your context. You can provide a class instance, or you can provide a simple object that then includes uh, smaller getters that recompute whenever a specific property changes and not when any property changes. There's more use cases for context beyond just forms. Um, you could provide form validation where your top level form component has a validation context which carries all the uh, necessary uh, state and functions to compute your validation error messages and hooks them into your um, you know, text inputs or select inputs automatically. So you don't have to worry about passing uh, through all that state. Um, and there's many other use cases for this that I sadly don't have time to dive into today, but I'd love to talk to you all about it later if you have the time. Um, but of course, context isn't always the solution to all our problems. Context is just another tool in our toolbox to build real cool composable components. It's not objectively better or worse than the other patterns. It's just another thing we can use. So you might still use contextual components if you want to uh, ship your parent and child components together. Like if you have very uh, particular usage patterns, you can still ship those components together. You don't have to use context. If you, know the, uh, if you want to deliberately restrict composition, if your components only work a particular way, you, maybe you don't need context. Uh, just ship them as one thing. Um, and also, if you know that there's no deep nesting, if there's a very straight parent-child relationship, you can ship them as contextual components. You know there's not going to be any extra layers, so just go for it. Uh, and services, of course, will always be great for global, any sort of global uh, information. You can use it for authentication, API handling, logging, whatever. You can use context for that as well. But typically, you don't need to override things like um, API handlers uh, for particular component trees. Usually that'll still be fine as a global thing. If you have a use case for um, logging certain things for a particular component tree, go for it. Context is great for that. And finally, how do you test with context? So usually, you would like to test your components in the same sort of environment that it'll run in in uh, production. So you want to run it under realistic scenarios, which means that if you have something that provides the context, that's what you want to use in your tests. If there's a component library that gives you the provider component, you want to invoke that provider component in your test and wrap all your tests in that component. So if you have a lot of integration tests for your component that consumes this provider, you'd have to repeat this provider uh, component in all your tests, which might become tedious. Like if you have hundreds of these, you always have to repeat the provider, which you don't want to do. So we could introduce a helper, which I would love to see added in Ember Test Helpers, which uh, maybe you should open a pull request for that. But you, we could add a helper that allows you to override the test template for a group of tests. Um, so you define that in your before each hook to override the test template for the whole module. And then this uh, will render the add-on provider outside of your component for all the tests in here. So all the tests will use the provider already. You can also use the context provider if you want more control over the particular values that you want to provide. But if all you're trying to do is to overwrite the value for a particular context, we can also introduce a helper that uh, does just that without modifying any sort of template stuff. We have a helper that's called provide, which basically injects the context uh, straight into the test. So there's no extra template stuff happening. Uh, you can this way give it the values that you want to use. And I believe Embedata is already using this sort of thing in their tests, or was trying to. Uh, and this way you can also pro uh, provide multiple different contexts in your tests without having to do the whole nesting thing in your templates. 
Um, and this was supposed to be a surprise. Um, hey, you can use context already. There's an add-on that I wrote. I didn't want to compromise in I, uh, my component library. I didn't want the APIs to be different between React and Ember. Um, and I didn't want to give up on context because I, I really enjoyed the developer experience in React that context enabled, the composability that was available. So I went ahead and built an add-on that does it for Ember. Um, which you can use these days, and I've heard a couple of people already using that in their projects. But of course, there's also the context RFC, which you may or may not have seen. I believe context should be part of Ember, and we're working on making that happen. Context-based components already live in our production UI. Um, that's been shipping for a couple of months now. And I'd like to invite all of you to try context in your add-ons or apps or test products. And Please talk to me about how you've used context in your apps. Tell me about your use cases. Um, I'll be here now. You can find me on Discord. Um, and that's it. Thank you for listening, and let's chat. <laughs>